This is a Piece of the Attraction podcast with leading dating and attraction expert for men, Kezia Noble. Gloves off conversations, exchanges, debates and confessions that dish up the insights and serve the solutions. Now over to the lady herself. Welcome to a Piece of the Attraction podcast. For over a decade, my team and I have been helping men from across the globe enhance their lifestyles, improve their attraction skills, and maximize their confidence and potential in order to be their best and most authentic selves. The content here is unfiltered, and hopefully in this over-filtered era we all currently inhabit, our straight-talking advice, our honest confessions and insights will cut through all the niceties and serve to help you action better choices. This is a Piece of the Attraction podcast. Remember, you can find and download all the episodes on Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify and iTunes. Dieting and fitness has become a multi-billion dollar industry, but specifically in the last 10 years, there has been a noticeably large surge in newfangled versions of the more traditional diets, versions that mesh better with today's, and I use this word of deliberation, obsession with all things to do with healthy living, clean eating, and wellness. And yet despite, and this is gonna be a long list of despites, despite one in seven people now belonging to a gym, Despite the fact that two thirds of people in Britain are currently on some sort of a diet, despite the 45 million Americans who start a diet each year, and despite the infatuation with healthy eating, clean eating, sugar-free eating, the carbs on a Monday and protein restriction on a Tuesday diet plans, despite all that, people are still putting on weight. So my main question today is, are we overcomplicating it all? Can a past era, a past approach to eating and exercise hold the solutions? I believe it can, but hey, what do I know? I'm just an enthusiast. I confess this topic falls way out of the remit of my profession, which is precisely why I've invited today's guest to the show, Dr. Asim Malhotra. He's not only a passionate enthusiast on this subject, but he's also an expert on it. Dr. Asim Malhotra is an award-winning consultant cardiologist. He is one of the most influential health campaigners in the UK. In between writing for academic medical journeys and sharing his expert advice on notable TV stations such as the BBC, Channel 4 and CNN, he wrote a best-selling book called The Piopi Diet. Am I pronouncing it right? Piopi? Piopi, Piopi yes, Diet. Yeah, <laughs> and released his documentary in 2016, The Big Fat Fix, and I had the privilege of attending its premiere, which took place in Westminster, alongside members of Parliament. Why I was there, I still don't know to this day. Um, as quoted from Dr. Malhotra's website, and I'm going to use my superhero accent now, this is not just a cardiologist. This is a man who wants to change the world one mill at a time by not just rocking the system, but by rebuilding it. Pleasure to have you on the show. Nice to be here. Kessie. Nice to see you again. Yeah. We haven't seen each other for... Yeah, it has been a while. Because we're, we're also friends, by the way. We are also friends. And um, I think we met, when was it, 2015? Yes. Long time ago. And it started from a, t a tweet. You tweeted, what was it? It was you. It was a, based on uh, an editorial I'd written in the British Journal of Sports Medicine called You Can't Outrun a Bad Diet. And I'm, I know that you instantly related to that. You agreed mm. and supported that statement that there mm. was this, there's a mentality out there that people think that they can eat what they like mm. and then burn it off by going to the gym or vice versa. And I know that you had a strong opinion in agreement with that particular Very statement. Very much so. So that's how we, I think, we connected initially through Twitter. First question. What do slim people have in common? Oh, that's a good one. What do slim people I've have in common? I've got the answer. Well... You see, that all relates to uh, a number of factors, but most importantly, I think, is that they are able to um, either eat foods that aren't going to interfere with their appetite control mechanisms. Um, but in general, in general, they tend to eat healthier than people who are overweight or obese. 
You want to know my answer? Go on. They don't eat a lot. Muslim okay. people, if you look at them, they don't eat that much. There's a few exceptions. My ex-husband was one of them. He can eat whatever he wants and he's a rake. But I actually put it down to the fact that he's Parisian. <laughs> so, so, so that is true. That is absolutely true. But the question is, why do they not eat a lot? Because they're not obsessed with food. They're just not obsessed with it. We've become obsessed with food. We, we're living in an era where um, people, you know, if you ask them, what do you like to do? They'll say, I love eating. And if you'd have returned back, let's say, 20 years ago, not 30, 20 years ago, and said, what's your pastime? And someone said, eating, 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 and eating out. You would have said, sorry, is, there something, is this a wind up? You know, people used to kind of like say, I, I remember people saying, I like Chinese food or I like Indian food. There was a particular type of food they liked. They didn't say, I like eating in general. It just wasn't a thing. And if you look at our culture now, the restaurants are everywhere. You can go to a normal shop and there's a restaurant there, like in the middle of a garden center. And then you put on the television and there's a, a, a sort of food related game show almost or documentary. So I think it's just an absolute obsession with food, which is why people are eating more. So what I would say is, I think there are many people who are not overweight and slim who are equally obsessed with food. Um, I'm obsessed with food. I'm a complete foodie. You do a lot of exercise. My life, well, I'll, you, come, on, I'll come on to the exercise bit in a minute, me but too. my life revolves around food. And I love cooking. But what's crucial is that I ensure that I'm eating as healthy food as possible. And I think that's the difference. Now, one of the problems around the obesity epidemic is that actually a lot of the food that people are eating in the modern day is um, designed uh, to encourage more consumption of food through addictive properties, through affecting appetite control mechanisms. There's a, a colleague and friend of mine in the States called Jason Fung, who's a, a kidney specialist, but has also become an expert in obesity. And he says one thing which I think makes a lot of sense. You can tell people to eat less, but you can't tell people to stop feeling hungry. So the question is, why are those people feeling hungry? And one of the answers is sugar. You know, it's become almost unavoidable. 70% of the foods found in the supermarket have added sugar. The food industry, there to make money. They're there to sell food. They will spike your food with sugar. Now, in my own experience with patients, when they understand this and they quit the sugar, they suddenly find the weight comes off, not because they are now suddenly controlling their appetite, it's because it naturally happens that way. They're not suddenly, and that I think is a crucial distinction between why people are overweight and other people are not. Now, some of it could also be genetics, of course, as an element. Yeah, of that. I, I agree with that. There's some, but, it, it takes, you know, I've noticed there are some people that, including me, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I just, my, my weight doesn't, you know, really fluctuate at all. Um, but I have a, one of my parents is very, very thin. And I think that I've, I'm quite small boned and if I ate and ate and ate and ate, you would see a difference, but it wouldn't be as much as, it wouldn't have such But you a, find it easy. You're not having to battle all the time. No, it's no. a natural for you to not eat a lot and not be like, I've got to eat lots of food. It's in your mind, it's natural. It's not that you are but battling was, but with But that your was appetite. natural for everybody. Okay, I'm gonna, because I haven't explained to the audience what my theory is. And I have noted everything that you've said, it's all stored up here, because there's a, things about sugar I would definitely want to bring up with you um, and about the psychology behind it. You know, as you said, you know, you cannot stop someone being hungry. You can tell someone to stop eating, but you can't tell them to stop being hungry. Okay. So my theory is that if we return back to an era and an era that had a, what I call a far simpler approach, because I already feel that this is overcomplicating things, um, a far simpler approach to eating and exercise and a less ex expensive approach too. Um, drum roll, drum roll. It would be the 1970s. I think it's it's silly to sort of compare back to the 1940s because when people say, oh, people are on rations, you know, people are on, on rationing, sorry, people on rationings then and, and people playing outside a lot more, you know, amongst um, bomb sites and stuff. They love to say that. But if you look at the 1970s, they had what we had. They had junk food. I remember I, I didn't grow up in the 70s, but I grew up in the 80s. I saw, a Mac, I saw more McDonald's then than now. I saw people eating more McDonald's then and now. Um, I saw 
um, you had Wimpy. Sorry for people in America who are just completely lost now, but you had Wimpy, you had Burger Kings, you have more healthy food. Rest no one had a healthy food restaurant in their high street in the 70s. No one would have gone into it, that's for sure. Um, so we had microwave food. We had cereals that were bad for us. We had McDonald's. Um, we had crisps. It's not so. I want to. That's why I think the 1970s is a very important era because it had all that stuff. And yet people were still, on the whole, very slim. I wouldn't even say slim, like, if, if you look at TV shows from the 70s and you transported me and put me in there, I'd look medium. I wouldn't look slim, I'd probably look medium. These people were really slim. And they weren't obsessed with food. They were not obsessed with food, they didn't join gyms, they weren't working out all the time, they weren't like, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of things I wanna mention, so I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna, yeah, we'll come to the gyms as well. Yeah, people I'm are gonna do exercise. exercise now than they were then. Yes, we'll exactly. About. They're doing more exercise now than they were yeah. then. And, and that's what I really want to get to, which is the whole you know, relationship yeah. we have with food. Yeah. But will you agree with me that in the 1970s, they did have McDonald's and they did have fast food chains and they did um, have crisps and... They did, so they did. They did, I okay. agree, but the crucial thing is it's actually a lot more prevalent now. So, so they it's healthy options them. now. They didn't have healthy options then. Well, no one had health well, foods. Well, I think if you look at most of the data, we were, we were eating a lot more food in the home in the 70s. There was a lot more cooking, even though these microwave yes, stuff was coming on. So think, now what's happened is, and most recent data, which I think is quite shocking, Kezia, is half of the British diet, half of the British diet is now ultra processed food. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? It means food that essentially comes in a packet mm -hmm. and has at least five or more ingredients, highly palatable, there for taste, nutritionally unbalanced. And when you eat something that's nutritionally unbalanced, you're going to want to eat more because it's not, you're not going to be satisfied if you keep eating more and more food and you're more likely to store those as fat. So actually there has been, of course, those things exist in the 70s, but I think it's a lot more prevalent, there's a lot more marketing. So the food availability has increased. The other thing that's happened in the 70s is our sugar availability has massively increased as well. So we're consuming a lot more sugar than we were then. So when you combine all of this together, there are lots of factors. So the food environment has for, made it- for, for, By the way, I'm just drinking coffee and there's, there's four <laughs> sugars in here. So I think it is multifactorial, <laughs> but I think ultimately what drives behavior in a population, and even as individuals, more than anything else, mm -hmm. is actually our food environment. So anyone that, you know, if you look at behavioral science, we know that um, if you're in an environment of ultra-processed foods, you know, you, you, you can't really exercise personal responsibility if you haven't got the access to healthy food and even less so if it's heavily marketed and prominent so there are certain places but i'm living in the same environment as you which is where which is a uh, which is a place that you know we're living in an era where there's food everywhere sure so i'm living in the same environment yeah. you're living in the same environment yeah. and all these slim people running around are living in the same environment as overweight people which is access to bad food Yes, but there is definitely a difference between socioeconomic groups. So people from poorer backgrounds actually have, um, you know, it's, the food is cheaper, so it becomes part of obviously their spending, um, you know, a certain proportion of their income on, on ultra processed foods. They're trying to obviously, you know, make two ends meet. So for them, and they're more stressed. So there, all these factors also play into the fact that you do see big difference in socioeconomics. Now, I, I, I have, live in no, North London. No, I, I have to. And I I, I, I live in North London. I have to Tessier. object to this. I live in a relatively affluent area. I live in, in Hampstead, Chelsea. In Hampstead, and, and I don't see much I, obesity. Well, I do. I, okay, so this is the thing. I have to get to this, okay? I do know that if you go to more, um, you know, deprived areas, then you are going to see people who are, are more overweight because, you know, they, they, they go for the easy option, the cheaper option, which usually has more calories in it. Two things I want to mention here. Two things. Um, those deprived areas have always had, you know, that kind of really awful food and takeaways and chicken shops, whatever you want to call them, fried chicken shops in those areas. They've always had it, like, at least for the last 20 years. Mm. This is, I've said, a spike, a noticeable spike. The second thing is, I, I live in Chelsea, I go to very, very nice places, and I looked at people who, uh, they're big, they're big and they're wealthy. These are very wealthy people. Um, and they, you can see they're overweight. And it's something that I didn't see 15 years ago so much. I did not see it 15 years ago. 
So um, yes, maybe on the whole, they are slimmer in more affluent areas that we live in, but there's still, you know, there is still this kind of gradual weight, you know, weight gain in, in all spectrums of society, I believe. I, that's what I see. Well, 60% of our adult UK population is overweight or obese, and it does affect all socioeconomic groups. There's definitely a greater preponderance in the poorer background, people from poorer backgrounds. But ultimately, in terms of a hierarchy, Kezia, because, you know, things are multifactorial, but there are certain things that are more important than others. It is a fact that are, you know, that we have shifted away from cooking at home. What happened to the British lunch hour? You know, people are eating on the go. Yes, there is, you can, in certain places, get some healthy food, but overall, if half of our diet is all to process food, we're not eating at home as much as we used to. We're not having mm. two or three meals a day, mm. which is home cooked food. And I think that's a big factor. Right. Let's look at a typical breakfast, lunch and dinner from 1978. Okay. okay. And I've actually done a lot of research on this. I've gone online, but there's not a lot online. So I went and spoke to people, people, you know, that actually lived in 1978 and remember it. So this was a typical breakfast. It would be uh, two slices of toast with butter and then on top of it would have been jam or peanut butter or something or Marmite. Uh, or it would, have been, it would have been cereals, shredded wheat or Weetabix. Okay. Um, lunch. Now this is interesting. It was nearly always sandwiches. Okay. And what did they tell us? Clean, clean eating and, and all these diets. They say, oh no, no, carbs are bad. Carbs are bad. You don't want to eat a sandwich. And I've eaten sandwiches and people and they've gone, like this, like I've had a sandwich and people have looked at me like, she's having a sandwich. They had sandwiches in the 1970s. And what were in those sandwiches? Very, very basic. It was either cheese and pickle with butter, or it would be uh, ham or um, cooked processed meat, cold carts or cooked processed meat. So they were eating processed food. They were eating processed meat. This, I've spoken to a lot of people, they said that was basically the two sandwiches that they would either have it, um, they would make it at home like a packed lunch, or they would go to like a little deli that, that made the sandwiches. But that would be the two options. They've also said that you would have laughed in those days if someone had come along with a massive salad and said, that's my lunch. Salad was always something on the side if you had a cafeteria, because a lot of the officers used to have a cafeteria. and. Um, You'd have like a you know, tomato and a piece of let lettuce on the side, but the whole thing wouldn't be a salad like they do now. Dinner. Dinner was uh, nearly always home cooked meals. You're right about that. Um, it was meat and two veg, meat, vegetable, mm. potatoes. Um, guess what, guys? Newsflash they had pudding after. And wow, what puddings did they have? Stodgy puddings. They would have a treacle pudding, rum barber. Oh brings back memories, angel delight, custard, creme caramel, not all at once, but in one serving. Um, but they love tinned fruit and you know, syrup, sugary syrup. This is all the stuff that people say, do not touch this. They were eating carbs, they were eating stodgy food. And guess what they had also in between that? Cool. They had a tea lady. who used to have a whole bunch of goodies on her tea tray. So these people were eating. They were eating bad stuff, as people say. And you go look, go look. I challenge anyone to just put on like an old TV show from the 70s. Not with actors, mm. with people in the audience, a game show, audience members, they're tiny. So what are, what the hell were they doing right? And what the hell are we doing wrong? Well, I think certainly the home cooked food in the evening is important. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing stodgy, I think- Stodgy, very stodgy home cooked the, meals. Well, we'll talk about, we're gonna talk about starch in a second. Puddings, I should say. But also, we've got to remember as well, Kezia, in those times, our heart disease mortality rates were... Yes, I'm not saying they're healthier. We're, we're, but yeah. yeah. So no, no, no. Yeah. So weight and health yeah. are not necessarily okay. the same thing. But, I'm not um, saying that. And they smoked a lot too. Exactly. And the smoking was much higher. But I think... Yeah, well, catching. actually, interestingly, smoking, smoking <laughs> suppresses <laughs> appetite, doesn't yes, it? Yes, I know. But, um, <laughs> but I think the other thing that is important to say is I think that the amount of snacking, yes, of course people did, has increased significantly. You know, we've gone from what was a lot of people having three meals a day, they might have a little bit of breakfast, some toast and some marmalade. Mm -hmm. You're right, a couple of sandwiches at lunch and then a home cooked meal. And if you're doing that, actually, to be honest, compared to what people are doing now, mm. that's probably a lot um, healthier. Yeah, because people and, are and filling up eat, these salads. And I see them, I'm not gonna name any names um, of these top <laughs> companies, I'm not. 
But I see people making bad decisions in front of me. Like they'll, yeah. they'll say, oh, look at me. And they've got this salad, which is like huge. Like the, the plate is bending because it's like in these kind of like boxes. I don't know what they are, but yeah. they're kind of like bending, you can see. And it's like, I'm looking at a salad and I'm looking at, you know, it's got egg in it and it's got all this kind of like, it's got some protein, it's got some tuna and things. And it looks healthy. I'm thinking, but there's too much. That's just too much. So you're just yeah. packing so, in so, 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 so many So actually, you're right about mm. that. I think you've mentioned this before about portion sizes. Oh, I'm getting to that. So, so I, I am so I think, portion size so I think, queen. I think that's definitely <laughs> one element for sure. It's and, you've, huge, and, you've, it's, and you've hit the nail on the it's head It's one of but, the, the most important but, ones. Yeah, but I think that what also happening on, in, on now, I think if people eat three meals a day, and of course there are healthier and less healthy options, but three meals a day itself is also mm. a really big thing. How many people, it's so, you know, mid-morning snacks and then you'll have lunch and then there'll be something in the mid-afternoon and then there's a, there's a constant we're almost grazing constantly and i think that was probably another thing that's changed compared to the 70s we weren't grazing so no much. we weren't no and and i asked um i actually asked my mum about this because she remembers this and i said look you know i was i was talking about this this interview and i said you know how come people are eating so much more do you think just she's totally not passionate about this at all this subject but she's just like <laughs> no one grazed she said exactly you said nobody was eating between meals and nobody was thinking about food i think they looked at food as fuel yeah. they had their sunday roast they looked at you know they looked forward to yeah. that and they looked forward to maybe a special meal but it was just food is fuel and I so, have that relationship yeah, with food. So it's a really good point I think you raise about the thinking about the food as well. So the th other other aspects of, besides the fact that we've got, you know, the marketing, advertising, all mm. that stuff has increased. Um, chronic stress in society, Kezia. We are generally more stressed at the moment. There's yeah. a lot more stress. And um, the, that also drives this sort of eating, you know, people working night shifts or just generally stress. People mm. see it for comfort. They, 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 they yes. for comfort as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think you have all these things combined and it does create this, you know, this tsunami of chronic disease and obesity that we're, mm. we're, we're struggling with right now. And yet drinking's gone down, hasn't it? With the younger ones, drinking's gone down. Yeah, smoking's gone down. These were all stress relievers, weren't they, before? The yeah. drinking and the smoking. But I think the smoking thing, it became, it, it, the, what the biggest driver, I mean, that, this, this actually relates to food and, and what governments can do. The biggest driver in our reduction in smoking prevalence um, in the last 40 years happened when actually um, governments intervened and really? they tackled the availability of cigarettes, smoke-free buildings. Mm -hmm. um, the we can't have food-free buildings. So. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, acceptability, so mm -hmm. public health uh, ed education campaigns, you know, smoking kills, lung cancer, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the affordability, in fact, interestingly, the taxing on cigarettes probably was the most important factor in driving down consumption. And if you think about it now, we go to the supermarket, what does it do if you go and buy a, um, if you're buying your groceries and you have to now pay for a plastic bag? Two things happen. One, you're less likely to have a yes, plastic bag. Yes, it's work. But also you're thinking, hold on, there's a reason for this. Mm, it's an of environmental it, thing. It has worked. So that's why a sugary drinks tax has a double effect because economically people will purchase less if it's more expensive. But also the thing, hold on, this the reason it's more expensive is because we know, you know, a lot of information is coming out telling us that sugar is bad for health. So I think that's you know the availability of you know I work in a hospital, Kezia, and we are basically serving junk food to our patients. Mm. I mean, this is how prevalent. This this issue has become. But, but well, in, in the seventies, you didn't you didn't have that kind of to that level. I, Trolleys going on literally with just sugary drinks, but you crisps, did. and chocolates. Well, Not I don't know in the hospitals, but you had these sh these sugary drink. Okay, they, they didn't have the sugary drinks. I bet they didn't have Luke. Well, can I say Lucas? So they didn't have like yeah. soda. What can I call it? Um, Sugar sweetened beverages. Or yeah, well, they had lots of tea. They had squashes. I live on squash. Yeah. Full fat squash. I live on it. Diluted squash. I live on it. They didn't, they did have that stuff. They had squashes, they had teas, they had coffees, um, cocoa, I guess. They did have it. I don't know. I, I think it wasn't complicated back then and it wasn't really restrictive. And yet they all stayed thin. They, they would do, I mean, I keep going back to this. They were doing something right. Uh, Are I, we overcomplicating it? Do you not think that we are overcomplicating it? If you just say to someone, just eat less, just eat less and you'll yeah, lose weight. Hasn't worked. It hasn't worked, Kezia. So this, this people, as you said, you started when well, you I don't know you if they've really, I've not heard that campaign. No, I have not heard this campaign well, of eat less. All I've heard is eat healthily, make better decisions. No, until recently, it was all eat less, move more. And in fact, a lot of these I um, never heard it. Weight didn't Watchers, get to me. all this sort of, these different companies, mm. low calorie drinks, low calorie food, yeah. people choosing low calorie options. 
doesn't work for no, very long. No, People, it doesn't. One of the reasons it doesn't work is because actually when you restrict calories, you um, drop your basal metabolic rate, so you, the amount you burn naturally from doing nothing. By the way, what many people don't realize, you know that you don't have to, I'm not, I'm a big advocate for being active, but actually you don't have to do any exercise to lose weight because about 60 to 75% of all the calories mm -hmm. that you burn happen from doing nothing. Yes. This is from organs no, functioning, keeping your blood temperature at a certain level, you know, cell function. So I think that actually what you know when we're talking about a whole population of people around the world we've suddenly not become irresponsible collectively something else is going on and it usually always links to the environment all these yes, other things no, you mentioned I agree are correct massively no massively you know? and, and, and some of that again is portion sizes have increased yes for sure portion sizes have increased even the junk food portion sizes have increased and have i think mcdonald's the, increased you, well I, if we, we took a mcdonald's from the like, burgers have increased in have size they? And also, like you look at the, um, really? like Coca Cola, yeah, the burgers, the burgers have increased size. In, Coca -Cola. in McDonald's, because I thought well, that they, well, it's like I it's very industrial, and they haven't really, it hasn't really changed well, I know since that, the eighties. I, at I least. know, I know that if you look at no, if you look at the kind of meals that people are getting in McDonald's and the Happy Meals and all that kind of stuff, the amount of food that has gone into it has definitely increased. Mm -hmm. Even the sugary drinks. The, I think it's the, the option, the isn't it? You can the have the mega extra large yeah, one. All of that. Yeah, but if you go for the one that we were like uh, the kids, I don't, I don't want to talk about kids' obesity. By the way, I, I actually don't because they are doing whatever their parents give them. Um, so I'm going to try and step away from that. If we look at, um, though, if we look at a Happy Meal, that has not changed in size. I'm sure I saw someone eating a Happy Meal the other day, and I used to have Happy Meals now and again when I was young. I don't think the size has changed. I think the option to have go larger, go extra, I think that's changed. But if you if you met an alcoholic and, and you said to him or her, eh, just cut out the drinking, just cut it out. Have a glass of wine here and there, but cut it out. You're on a slippery slope. Would someone say, oh, you're alcohol shaming that person? Well, they say, you know, how dare you speak to that person no, like that? But no, if you say if, to an overweight person, eat less, they say, you're fat shaming me. So, yeah, it's, so it's very I, difficult to help anybody. So, so, so Kezia, so, yeah, I so. see these patients all the time. Mm. And I speak to these patients and I treat these patients. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to have an understanding of what are the roots behind someone consuming too much alcohol. There may be so many issues. Of there may course. be stuff going on at home you know, social problems, unemployment, you know, stress. So you have to deal with the roots because of otherwise it's overly so really simplistic. But, but, and it will not what, no, what I'm trying to say is that, and I, I, I know uh, someone very, very close to me is, uh, um, he, he's a, what, what, what is the word when you're someone's such an alcoholic? There's a certain word, not critical alcoholic. There's a word for it when somebody is a, um, it's when when they're, 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 they're so knee deep in it that they're beyond help. I've forgotten what the word is. Okay. Anyway, but yeah. Right. And the thing is, we've been telling him, you, you just got to cut out drinking. You know, you've just got to... Years and years ago, we were just saying, just, you know, go easy. Swap the spirits for wine. And that's what everyone does. If you see, if you see a good friend drinking too much, you will say to him, just cut it out a little bit, right? And they don't say, well, you're, you're alcohol shaming. This is my, my point. They don't say, you're alcohol shaming me. They don't. But why, if you say to an overweight person, you know, I think you need to eat less. I'm your friend and you need to eat less. Why do they, why do they get, and I saw it when you put something on your Facebook, you know, um, or Twitter, I can't remember saying that you're going to do this podcast and you had your followers going, she's going to fat shame. That's all she's going to do is fat shame. And it was immediately on the attack. And I think people like the alcoholic don't want to be told drink less, eat yeah. less. And oh. I remember when we spoke to this alcoholic who is still very close to me. He's beyond help now, sadly. But I remember him having the same reaction when people said, cut it out, cut out the drinking. You're really, you know, it's, it's you're really, um, you know, you're going down a rabbit hole here. He would get very angry about it. Like, you know, don't mm. tell me. So, so is it an addiction? So I think, I think, I think for some people for with food and sugar definitely is an addiction. I think with alcohol, certainly that's, that can be Sorry, an addiction. Sorry, chronic alcoholic. That's what I was looking yeah. for, chronic. Yeah, it's so an addiction. That was the word, yeah. So therefore people don't respond to simple kind of telling them, feel like they're being told off. And I think with obesity as well, I think it's overly simplistic because people, as you say, they know, right? But why can't they eat less? So that's the question. And when I speak mm, to okay. my patients, I always talk to them actually about being overweight. And I say, listen, I'm concerned about your weight. I'm sure you know this already. This is how I approach it. Uh, you've got to be sensitive about it all. 
let's think about how we can help you. And that's the way you approach it. Now, with me specifically, one of the um, mechanisms I found, and it helps patients and it's detailed in my book, is actually to help them understand, again, why are they over-consuming? Is it something in the foods, the types of foods that they are eating that's making them always hungry? Mm -hmm. And when they cut out the starch and sugar, and the reason, so the difference between um, one of the problems with modern starch is very different to what our grandparents were eating, which tend to be more bake, you know, bakery-based breads. Modern supermarket in the seventies, you're yeah. saying that it was a different type of bread. Yeah, to the so, same we have yeah. Now. so modern, modern. They had white bread. They used to eat white yeah, bread. Yeah, that's fine. But it's a lot of it's now is ultra processed. If you go in the supermarket and you pick up a loaf of bread, brown or white, doesn't matter. Look, read <laughs> same, them, same shit. Read the number of ingredients. No, read them. It is exactly the same. Actually, it's just as bad <laughs> yeah. with each other. I don't think there's any definite. Better. You think carbs are bad? You think bread no, is bad? I think ultra processed food is bad. And. If you have type 2 diabetes, the one thing you need to cut out first, because it's a condition really of carbohydrate mm. intolerance, is starch and sugar. Now, vegetables are carbohydrates, but they're fibrous carbohydrates and they're fine. But things like overconsumption of bread and pasta, you know, rice, potatoes to some degree, especially if it comes in people, chip form. If that's your this. base, if that's the base of your diet, though, Kezia, if the base of your diet, then it's going to increase risk of all these chronic diseases. What were the base... And, I and, will, we, still, and we still have these chronic diseases was, in, the, in the 70s. We still have, you know, heart, heart disease why was why were they common. thinner? This is what we're going to get to. I why were the they thinner? I think overall consumption of food was less. They were eating smaller portions. But, but no, not because it was out of choice. It was natural. It was easy because of the availability of food. It wasn't, they weren't making an active mm. choice. Think about it. They weren't. It was no, easy. No, they didn't think about it. Was it was easy to be. Yeah. Now it's not easy to be for all the factors we've talked about. But I think when it, when it comes to what ha ha helps my patients certainly... Because I tell them, listen, I don't want you to count calories. I don't want you to even restrict your portions. I don't want you to think about it in that way. Really? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, this is you do the opposite to me. Then I would just say to well, them. Well, this is what's helped them. And what? Yeah. Well, the, the traditional. No, you're approach, the doctor. I'm just saying. No, I, but the traditional I, approach I, hasn't helped. If it hasn't helped them, clearly, and they've tried everything. A lot of these people come to me and say, "Listen, I've done all this. I've yo-yo diet." They haven't. Whatever. They haven't done it and, though. That's well, the thing. No, a lot of them have, Kezi, because well, I, I, I have their history, so I know what they've no, done. No, and no, they've no, lost no. a lot of no, weight. No, no, no. Oh, I see. By, okay. by portion control, calorie restriction. I thought you said it made no difference. No, no, it made a big difference. But then they regain. It. So that, and it's also they feel miserable because hold on they're having these low calorie foods and they're just not enjoying it's not satiating you know food is one of our sensual pleasures it's an essential we, we can't survive without food but also it's a sensual pleasure and it's something we want to enjoy so I recommend to them lots, based of, upon, lots of sex oh well that's a separate discussion well, that's the thing. I think foods replace sex I think people that, people get when people are more like excited to go to a restaurant than, than have sex well, I, don't know. I, I don't, really do I don't, I don't know <laughs> the data I whether we're having rumor. less sex now than we were but if, if in people the 70s, are depressed but, and, but, but no generally though on a separate a separate point you know, regular a good relationship regular sex is good for the health and yeah. good for, the, for heart disease we know that for lots of different reasons but coming back to food for a second <laughs> If I tell my patients to cut out, you know, the, the ultra processed food, stop snacking, eat till you're full and have fat as the base of your diet. The reason why, so fat is satiating, it keeps you feeling full, and, but eat nutritious foods, you know. Um, but not too much. Lots of, no, but I don't have to say anything. I say, I want you to do this, but just don't snack. And if they do the three meals a day and they don't snack and they cut the sugar, within a month, I mean, these people are feeling better in themselves. And if they feel better, they're more likely to sustain it because they're like, suddenly finally got more energy, mm. they're sleeping better. They're not feeling hungry. And that's the key thing that people consistently come back and said, you know, doctor, the one thing that's changed, which I never thought, is that, you know, I've got this, I obviously was addicted to sugar. I cut that out and I'm not feeling hungry anymore. Yeah. In fact, that's another interesting point. I suspect in the 70s, okay, there was a pudding they were at the other day. They were sugar. But, but they were, but they weren't, it wasn't in all the foods no, we're eating. Now we've got it. We're having sugar three meals he a day. You caught me out, I know. So you know? a lot of people say so to me, that's very, I was, yeah, you caught me out there because, um, I have a lot of sugar in my coffee and tea. I have I have about four coffees or teas a day, and I put four sugars in each one. And everyone's like, oh, and I have squash. And I go, oh, oh my God, but I don't have any processed food, hardly ever. So hold on, so, so I've got none so of the so sugar. Again, so how many teaspoons of sugar do you think you have in a day? Teaspoons, uh, oh, one, two, three, uh, four, four, well, 16. Okay, 16. And I have a glass of wine that's got sugar. Well, it's a different type of sugar. So 16 teaspoons of sugar a day you think you have. Okay, mm -hmm. a lot of people in this country are having about 40. Yeah, no, but that's the thing because the hidden sugar exactly. that they're having. Exactly. I agree, exactly. I agree. But in the 70s, and I'm going to go back to the 70s, they were having very large pudding. Well, not large, they were having puddings, they were having sweets. They were eating a lot of sweets, apparently. That's another thing I found out in the research, or buying sweeties. 
No, I remember as a kid, I used to... You oh, know, you're letting on your age now. <laughs> I used to have a, a, t- a tuck shop in my school. I, I remember the tuck shop. I would have, you know, every day, without fail... Did you steal from the tuck shop? I would have... No, I would never steal. God. Definitely not. I but um, I had uh, <laughs> I had half a Kit Kat or whatever. That was, you know, maybe a packet of crisps. Um, but again, you know, the metabolism of children is much higher as well. So obviously we were being... At, now, child obesity has taken over. I saw a picture. But again, it's about the amount of, of, of junk food we're eating. Amount. We're going back to the trigger word, amount. I, um, what, I, saw, I found a picture of my school. Um, this is my primary school. And I was in there from 86 to 92 or something. And there was this one kid who was overweight. And yeah, he got bullied. It's wrong. It's terribly wrong. But it happens. Children can be cruel. And I looked at this picture of him. He looked normal by today's standards. And I was thinking, this boy is like, I don't know, big boned maybe, but he certainly wasn't fat. But we perceived him as young kids as being really big. And now he would be an average kid. That's worrying. That's really, really worrying. And people keep looking at thin children going, oh, you know, look how skinny they are. You know, maybe... And I'm thinking it's actually healthier. It's actually healthier. So in general, you can be an unhealthy weight, of course, you can be very overweight and obese, mm. but there isn't any such thing as a healthy but weight. But it's our perception of, of what is There are a lot of skinny kids that are eating now. junk food and having lots of sugar. Yes. And, and, the, and, and actually, you know, there's something called tofu, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Yes. I think you I'm know, that. So, that, so there is that <laughs> big issue as well, Kezia, as well. So I think we need to, we need to focus on overall health. I think obesity is, is a big issue, but I think the obesity problem is a marker of a much bigger problem because mm. a third of type two diabetics are normal BMI, normal body mass, not overweight or obese, normal. And again, they have the same, um, we call it insulin resistance. So the body, the, the hormone that's thought to be the fat storing hormone that is also linked to heart disease and many chronic diseases, cancer, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, is having chronically high insulin in the bloodstream. What triggers that? Too many refined carbohydrates and sugar, mm-hmm. poor sleep, stress, and being sedentary. If you hit all of those and you focus it, listen, I'm going to make a real effort, and this is what my Pioppy diet lifestyle plan is about, is, and through relatively not very challenging things, I mean, in terms of exercise, very briefly, when you look at the... We will talk if you about go back, exercise. So if you, look, you know, if you look at the um, uh, areas around the world, like the blue zones, these are communities around the world where they have the highest longevity and they live to 90, 100, Example, not lots of hills. Well, Pioppy is one of them. Iceland, isn't it? Kyoto is one of them. There's places in the United States. There's really? Okinawa in Japan. Yeah. And they didn't have gyms, Kezia. They didn't have gyms. Oh, what, fuck what, gyms. What, what was their I don't exercise? believe in gyms. Well, good, we'll talk about that. <laughs> what, what were they doing? They were just walking. They were outside. They were walking everywhere. They, were con- they weren't sitting for a long period of time. 1970s. They so were that, going so back that, to their 70s. Exactly. Well, actually, the other <laughs> thing about gyms <laughs> is that exercise stimulates appetite. So you can actually overcome. I've got so, so many so you, points on this. Well, let's talk about that then. Time? Time? 37 minutes. Oh, good. Okay, so we've got time. Right. Ready? Yeah. I'm really enjoying this. Are you finding it's good, it good? Yeah, it's okay. good? It's good. Right. I believe that exercise creates an unhealthy relationship with food. And I, I think what you're getting to here is essentially people now have an unhealthy relationship with food, which they didn't have before. And I think exercise is fueling that. Um, I mentioned to you before we did this interview, um, and you you laughed down the phone. There's a hashtag going around called Earn Your Roast. <laughs> hashtag Earn Your Roast. And uh, I just, I looked at that thinking, that is so fucked up on so many levels. It's like food has become a reward. And I think that that is so dangerous. So when I was young... Uh, you know, we would work up an appetite. It was called working up an appetite. We didn't sit there and think, I need to now earn that roast. It was just like, oh, I've worked up an appetite. I think I, I, I might have seconds even. That was it. It was a very healthy relationship with food. And I think exercise fuels that. And another thing I want to mention, I'd like you to get back to me on, on both points. I go to the park nearly every day. I have a dog. I walk him every day. And um, I, I get to look at the people in the, in the park and it's regulars there. They all go around the same time as I do. You've got um, two types of people doing exercise. You've got the dog walkers and you've got the joggers. And those joggers ain't getting any thinner because you know what they're doing? They're jogging and jogging and going, now it's treat time. And they stuff themselves. Whereas 
a dog walker is getting a pleasure from the exercise. And they don't, at the end of it, and I certainly don't after a long walk go, right, now I'm gonna, you know, earn, I've earned my sweeties, I've earned my extra, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I think- I So there's two points there. I think really, I agree on both of them. I think- Yes, we when, agree on when you look at When you look at longevity <laughs> and health, actually moderate activity, regular moderate activity, like brisk walking is the mm -hmm. best thing you can do. So there was a very good study looking at uh, ex-Olympic athletes and people who did a lot of sport, and they found that elite athletes didn't live any longer than golfers or cricketers. And they get flabbier. So Have you noticed well, that? Have you I've, noticed people that have really gone and done it hard and they've become like super, super fit, and then they've stopped for whatever reason, they can get an injury or just their lifestyle changes and they still so, have that appetite, that's yeah, the problem. So, so you're right, so one of the, uh, another colleague of mine, a very famous sports scientist in South Africa, Professor Timothy Noakes, he says, if you have to exercise to keep your weight down, your diet is wrong. Oh yeah. And a lot of these people, I and mean, I see ex-footballers really just, you know, some of them may be alcohol, I don't know, but they really <laughs> bloat up as they get older. Is. And debauchery probably eating a lot of <laughs> carbohydrates a lot of starch and sugar and even junk food but they're so active that for that period of time which you can't sustain to all no age, you can't exactly you know, two or three four or five hours of exercise a day no. that that suddenly you know and suddenly that all kind of comes out later on because they're eating the same foods and they're not being to that level of activity and, and the people that are doing a lot of exercises and I, I know i have so many friends and they're just spending all the time in the gym i'm like what about other areas of your life that need well, nourishment? So, so, and they look haggard, these so, women. So, they so, look like so tired. So, on that note, and with your background, obviously... Just because they want to eat. They said to with, me, I can't give yeah. up exercise because I love food so much, they said to me. So, and I said, but this is a ridiculous existence so there's a number to be of in things. a gym all day. I, I agree. There's a number of things. And I think you probably relate to this more you know, with your modelling background as well. Mm -hmm. I think there's also this culture of image that people... Everyone's trying to get a six-pack. There's all this sort of stuff on Instagram. Mm -hmm. There are these vision, you know, people are... Um, I think we are, we've become more superficial. We've become more hedonistic. We're looking for instant gratification. Yes. This earn your row stuff. And that is also a reflection of the, th of, of, of the fact we've lost some of the most important things in life, which is about actually sense of community. Yes. Good relationships. I know, this is the real You know, yeah. having a conversation with someone and not having to look at your phone and what's going on with Facebook or, you know, I know. all of this stuff, it all kind of is, is part of how we're living in the society and I think is contributing to misery mm. because actually sustained, deep, true happiness and sense of well-being doesn't yes. come from, you know, um, this, this, I think we've got an imbalance, you know, of course we like doing things for pleasure, but I think we're doing a lot more of this all the time. We're always looking for constant pleasures as opposed to like instant quick hits, whether it's the type of food we're eating or whether it's, um, you know, a culture of, uh, of of drinking too much alcohol or binge drinking, eating junk food. Um, I think I think we're trying to, th this is playing into kind of, um, uh, th there's a hormone that we use, it's called dopamine. Yes. And these give us like instant highs, but they don't, they, then you crash down and then people then get onto this cycle where they're constantly looking for a dopamine hit. A lot of the things we do in our environment are now looking for the dopamine hit. Oh what, yeah, so especially but, social media. But what's in, exactly, but no, what's interesting that's is the, worst. the hormone that is really associated with general sense of well-being and, and making you feel good and, and, and giving you a sense of happiness and is serotonin. The more you hit dopamine for the instant pleasure and you need more and more to get the same hit, and this plays into things like even sex addiction, the more the serotonin gets depleted. And actually you're making yourself more and more depressed Mm. And then you're trying to get an, an instant quick fix, mm. quick fix hit to cope with that. I think this is also part of this issue that we're discussing. I think when I see people in gyms, I don't mean people going to the gym now and again. Like my friends, it's my friend. I'm not obviously going to say any names. They know who they are. And they got children like me. And they had, we all had children around the same time. And um, I kept slim during my pregnancy. I kept very slim. And they kind of said, I'm eating for two which as you know is ridiculous you don't eat for two i just i ate normally i had terrible um Morning nausea service. no i had nausea so i couldn't really eat a lot but anyway i kept slim and they sort of just said no no i'm gonna eat for two whatever and then they had the babies and then they were straight they were they were actually in the gyms when they were pregnant they were like this in the gyms and eating a lot and i thought this is this must be putting stress on the body and I, I, I want to get clarification on that. It looks stressful and everyone's proud on Instagram. Look, I'm in the gym and I've got my belly and, you know, like I've got my baby in here and I'm still working out. Aren't I brilliant? 
And I'm thinking that's got to be putting pressure somewhere on you and the child. I don't know. I'm not qualified to say it is. But anyway, uh, moving on, they they kind of put the children. And I'm not. I'm no way judging people putting children in nurseries or leaving them with nannies. No way. I've done it, and this is not about that. This is a t- totally different subject. But they've done it for the reason so they can go to the gym. I said, how do you spend the rest of your time? They do a bit of work, you know, not not really anything. And then they spend so much time in the gym. And they said to me, it's because I'm, I love food so much. I don't want to give it up. I don't want to restrict myself. And I'm like, but what about other areas of your life that need nourishing for God's sake? It can't be gym food, gym food. There's one girl on Instagram and no, not one girl. There's lots of girls that have literally, what are the three things you like? This is how it defines them. Fun, fitness, and food. Fun, fitness, and food. Like, God, we are really living in the era of the bimbo, the age of the bimbo. Seriously. That's it. They're going gym, eating, gym, eating. And I just said, what kind of fucking existence is yeah. this anymore? It's an obsession with food yeah. and working out, food yeah. and working out. So I think I in Hampstead happy. and Chelsea where we live, we see predominantly slim people because they are spending, they're walking around, you know, in their kind of, um, what do you call it? Their leisure wear all the time because they're just going gym, eating, gym, eating. It's pathetic. Yeah. It's so one well, dimensional. I think, I, think, I think on that point as well, it's important that people should know that, you know, we use this phrase, you can't outrun a bad diet. One of the things that we reference in this editorial I wrote in the British Journal of Sports Medicine with, with two sports scientists is that um, there was a good study that showed that essentially if you're slim and you exercise, but you consume too much sugar, you're still increasing the risk of getting type 2 diabetes. And mm. there was an interesting anecdote that the man behind carb loading for exercise the guru professor timothy noakes who i wrote this with mm-hmm. this guy runs 70 marathons he gets in his late 50s you know he's putting on more and more weight he's still running marathons and he starts to develop type 2 diabetes and think what the hell's going on here he started to look at his own research and look at other research and realize it was because he was consuming too much sugar and carbs and when he cut that out everything got better and he then has gone, gone on a mission to now say, actually, you don't need to carb load for running, etc. And he was the guru. He wrote the book mm. behind it and now realized that it was wrong. Or there's another way that's just healthier. So I think people need to realize, even though they may be looking slim at this particular point in time. At a cost. I mean, look, but look, hold on. At yeah. a real cost. Cost of spending time with their children. Um, you know, what... The, um, they don't seem to have any hobbies now apart from gym and eating. I've literally, yeah. I'm not kidding. So the kidding. best thing, Kezi, you can do for your health in terms of exercise, I tell my patients this. Hold on, Just do 30 minutes. <laughs> 30 minutes of wrist walking a day, okay? Get a dog. Yeah. If you and, can, get a dog. Dog's, oh, not, dog's, dog's not for Christmas, it's for fitness. Listen, some of that, you're right, healthy, dog, having a dog generally is actually good for your health, okay? Having yeah, pets, and your well-being. And it's good for depression, well. apparently. So, Absolutely. I think dog walking is probably the best thing you can do. For I've never pet. seen a fat dog walker. <laughs> I'm still waiting. I've never seen a fat person from the 1970s or a fat dog walker. Well, it could also be that those people are less stressed as well, and therefore they're not going to... Yeah, you, you know, we, we all talk to each other. Uh, hello, how are you? We're not like... We are, you know, I'm really concentrating. Move out my way. I'm, you know, I'm determined to earn that roast. We're not like that. We're just yeah. like, yeah, chilled and relaxed. Um, it's, I think we're living in an era of guilt-free gluttony. It is guilt-free gluttony when you think about it. They're just, no one's really cutting down on the food. They're just making up for it in the gym. Something worth thinking about. I want to get your opinion on something. And it's quite controversial, this. Go on. What do you think of uh, the recent Cosmopolitan magazine that had that? And I think she is more, is she morbidly obese, was she? Or obese? I don't, I don't know what morbidly obese and obese is. Very overweight, definitely. I don't know what her body uh, much Well, was. she was... A very big girl and she was on the front of cosmopolitans and i I think the statement was you know be proud of your body be you know whatever it is what's your opinion on that so i think it's a difficult one Mm. i am very much against the i i think that the predominant issue around obesity is not because of personal responsibility i think it's all these external factors that are making people consume more um especially unhealthy food so I'm never, for me as a doctor, it's never about blaming an individual because I actually don't think it's the individual's fault. I think there are all sorts of factors involved. You don't think but it's the individual's fault? You don't think it comes down? I, I, think, I think when you talk about personal responsibility, you need to have knowledge and choice 
And if the information you're given is wrong, part of it's also been, you know, a lot of these people who are overweight are buying low fat foods that they think is healthy and then wondering why they're not losing weight. And also too, not having, eating too many, too and, much of and it. Not, not, and also not having access to, you know, or, or the predominant food is not, you know, home cooked food. So I think, I think it is down to a personal responsibility to a point. I really no, do. No, there's an element of that. Um, but when, but it, when you look at the hierarchy again, when you look at the population being, you know, there's something else going on in the environment. Listen, I have friends, okay. I have friends um, that they are... They're Muslim and they um, they grew up and, you know, they went to all the parties and university and everything and they still didn't drink alcohol because uh, their religion doesn't allow them to drink alcohol. They still didn't drink alcohol or eat pork, let's say. They, they kept to that, even though there must have been a ridiculous amount of pressure on them. So I think uh, I think it does come down to personal choice. I do I think, think, I remember... I think, I think personal choice is there, but I, I think never it's took smaller drugs. Aspect. I never took, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I, you know, I was around people at one point that were taking lots of drugs. Never did it. Yeah, but I mean, you know, your personality may be different. There may be other factors involved in their lives mm. that triggered the drug taking. You've got to, yeah, but every individual has a different mm. environment they grew up in and that also helps, you know, certain people are more, more disciplined for, because they've been brought up in a certain way. So I think we've got to... But coming back to your point okay, about okay. the cosmopolitan... Okay, but this is your opinion, yes. So the, so the, the cosmopolitan issue is my worry, and I think understandably are people worried, is that are we normalising, I think this is a question, by having the front cover and glamorising, if you wait, if you like, somebody who's very overweight, are we then contributing to this normalisation of obesity? And that is an issue, I think, absolutely. That I think that is something mm. concerning. We shouldn't accept this as just now being normal. Because the devastation to these people's health from being a certain way, um, you know, for their own personal well-being, um, is is massive. And they wouldn't we, put an anorexic on no, there. We can't, for example, right now, if we had, um, I don't know, somebody famous who suddenly appeared on the front cover of a magazine smoking a cigarette. Oh you God! Know, w- would that we wouldn't find that acceptable? I wouldn't care, so we, but I know there so would be a we huge shouldn't massive be glorifying reaction to people that. who are an, mm. in a very unhealthy way. We mm. shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I, I do think it's down to personal choice, and I, I think the, the I know what they were trying to do, Cosmopolitan magazine. I know what they were trying to do, like be proud of you know who you are and what your body shape is and i agree with being self-esteem is important and it's not about them not feeling proud about themselves would they put a, it's not about would them they put an anorexic them... on there I'm, I'm not talking about a very thin model i'm talking about someone with the bones showing you know karen carpenter style you know someone super super thin on there with the bones all showing would they have done the same no they wouldn't have. there would have been a backlash they would have said this girl is unhealthy and is there any real i mean they're both unhealthy so, so in theory, you can have a high BMI and be very healthy if you're like, for example, a rugby player has high muscle mass. So yes, I know, it's a yeah. quite a crude way of measuring it. And we need to move away from that. And I always say focus on health and there are better things to look at, like waist circumference, all that kind of stuff. But in this particular case, clearly, you know, um, uh, there are this, this person, individual, probably at some point is going to be at risk of high risk of having health problems mm. unless their weight is controlled. Oh, thank you for being so honest about that. A lot of people would probably try and dodge that question. Um, this is an interesting thing that happened, and it goes back to my, my portion obsession. Um, and you can find this on YouTube. You might have seen it already. Um, it's called the McDonald's diet. Have you heard of this? So they took a man, and they, they, he was overweight. He was, um, he was just given McDonald's every day for 90 days. And uh, he lost 37 pounds, and his cholesterol dropped from 249 to 170. And the only requirements were that he couldn't uh, have more than 2,000 calories and he had to walk 45 minutes a day. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, doctor. So if you're going to eat less calories that he was normally consuming, no matter where it comes from, exactly. okay, in a controlled, specific, this is what you're going to do, you will lose weight, of course. Any, any, every diet that which restricts calories makes you lose weight. Two things. One is, is it healthy? No, but well, uh, uh, his... Cholesterol drop from 249 to 170. Well, well, so... It's on uh, YouTube, by the way. We, you can check it out. Got, we can have a whole other discussion about cholesterol. But cholesterol is not that important. And in fact, I, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not that worried about cholesterol. <laughs> so the fact that cholesterol drop, It may have dropped, but other things may be going. Maybe he may have increased what we call his 
you know, he may be increasing his risk of getting other heart disease from other. I'm not encouraging this. I'm using so, it as an example. No, no. So, so the, is it sustainable? Is this what he's going to do for the rest of his? They've got, life? They've got gherkins in the um, quarter pounders, so that's the vegetable. You know why they put them <laughs> well, in there? Do you know why they put the gherkins? No, do you know why they put the gherkins? So, you're so holy even now. I've, I haven't walked no, because into I, a McDonald's. No, because these companies are <laughs> guilty of the way that they target children, most vulnerable members of society. I was targeted. Through their own advertising. I was I targeted. I think these c companies are culpable in this I, do, I don't problem. feel like a victim. I was targeted as much as the other kid. And I had my Happy Meal and I had my Hamburglar and all that. And... and uh, that was it. And we all had a McDonald's. We had our birthday parties at McDonald's sometimes. The one in Mayfair, by the way. The one in Mayfair. I used to that stuff as a kid, of course. But now, you know, I've so changed we, my whole perception about yeah. what, what, what is... Uh, and I, I know, think it's okay to have a McDonald's now and again. I don't think there's any problem again, with but, it. Yeah. But um, the point is that... Oh, by the way, why they put the gherkins in the... Is it the quarter pounder? I have mm. no idea. You know why? Well. It's because technically, this might be an urban legend, but technically, if they can't, if they didn't put it in there, it's got so much sugar in it that it would be a dessert. So they have to put the gherkin in it. What in the bread or whatever? Yeah. To, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that. That's what I, mean, I heard, but it could be an urban myth. Yeah. So great. This guy lost weight in ninety days. He's proven something. You have two thousand calories, and he's it's eating probably a lot less than he was maybe consuming three thousand calories. So he's going to lose weight. It's not healthy. Definition. But imagine if someone but had it's like not a, okay. But but the, I think the point in this, what I'm trying to make is I see people and eating and, 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 too and much way, healthy and, food. And who wants to eat seriously though? Who's going to eat McDonald's three times a day in whatever smaller portions? How long can you sustain that before okay. you get bored? I see. I think this whole term foodie is very dangerous. What you see, because I'm not a foodie and I, I hate to be defined as a foodie. I'm, I think I'm much more multidimensional than that. I would probably be OK with a very conservative kind of meal plan. It wouldn't bother me. If someone said you're never, ever going to have this again to eat, I'd be like, mm, OK, I'll live without it. It's fine. You'll never have, I don't know. I can't think of anything I even like that much that I would... I like Japanese food. I really like Japanese food. If someone said you'd never have Japanese food again, I'd be like, mm, okay, and get on with it. See, I don't have this relationship like, mm. oh, my, my, my life will fall to pieces if I don't get that meal or that particular type of food. Um, the point is that there's people that I see eating lots of healthy food and they're eating too much healthy food and they're still putting on the weight, which goes back to the whole idea of these people who go to gyms and they eat clean food and they're just eating too much clean food. You know, it's still calories in there. An avocado is 300 calories. It's 300 calories. Deal with it, right? <laughs> it takes me three days to eat an avocado, a whole one. Three days. But, but That's the only thing about avocado, portion control, guys. But the other thing about avocado is it's, that it's not about the calories. So the calories have different metabolic effects on your body. A calorie of alcohol has a different effect to a calorie of bread, to a different effect to the calorie effect. of meat. It's got a lovely effect. Alcohol's got a lovely effect. Uh, but, <laughs> it's a beautiful but, effect. You know, but avocados <laughs> are very satiating. You can, I can have an avocado and that can keep me going for hours. You know, so overall, my net consumption will go down because I've had something that's very fatty to mm. start with on its own without the sugar. 300 calories. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, there's also and by the way, actually, yeah. Katie, on that note. No one was counting calories in the 70s. No, they weren't. They weren't at all. No one would have all. said, what are you talking about? 300 calories. Like, no, I, just, I did my about? research on that. I wouldn't So care. the counting calories thing is a lot of nonsense. I mean, I just think it's rubbish. I think waste is stupid. I'm and, in fact, that should fit with your 1970s diet because they weren't no, counting no, calories. No, no, they weren't, but I'm not counting calories. I just brought up the 300 calorie because I did my <laughs> research last week on it. Um, I think, I, would you say I have a healthy relationship with food from what I've told you? Yeah, I think I think you're. Yeah, I think you do have a healthy from what. Yeah, from what you've said. Mm. And do you think that you know that's something that other your people... your life doesn't revolve around? Food, Not at though. all. So what does your life revolve around? Alcohol, drugs, and cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> no, what does my life revolve around? Um, food is something which is. I mean, have you got something else that you would say yeah, is I your? I, I have a business. Someone... I have a child. I have interests. I have my friends. I have. Okay, I I, I probably drink too much wine. Okay. And I do have a couple of cigarettes here and there. That's right. naughty, but um, ah, so the cigarette. So that's interesting. Like, uh, how two, long did we smoke for? Since I was fourteen. Okay, but two a day. So you know, you know, two a day. Yeah, but probably an appetite suppressant for you. Um, I have it after a meal usually, so I don't see how that's okay. possible. You know, I've got a good tip by the way from anyone listening. If you're um, when you finish your meal, have a chewing gum. You don't smoke having chewing gum because like that taste or brush your teeth it really 
um, suppresses the appetite. It st stops the craving for like seconds. Uh, also eating slowly, that massively helps. So when people are rushing eating, they usually get indigestion because they, the, the stomach, apparently it's like 20 minute delay for the stomach to let the brain know that you're full. So I eat very slowly, talk with people when you're eating very slowly. Um, I think, don't sit in front of your computer and eat. I think that's a bad one. People just go, mm -hmm. and they're like knee deep in Facebook or something and they're totally unaware. I mean, I'm sure you've got a lot more tips than that. I do think food is everywhere. I think, it, I saw the other day I went past a library and they were offering coffee and cakes. I was like, mm. it's a fucking library. You know, people should not be eating in a library full stop. Um, there is food everywhere, yeah. there, and I go to Westfield sometimes. And I'm like, they just you can't open avoid up. it. You can't avoid. And specifically, ultra processed food more as well. well it's I mean, just food everywhere, yeah. and it's like I go to. I, you've got them in garden centres now. You've got them in gyms. You know, all the gyms have got these huge restaurants, and people are just thinking about that going to that restaurant rather than the gym. I went to the museum the other day. I went to three museums. I took my child to the museums, and um, the restaurant. You know, it used to be just like a cafe and you get a coffee or a sandwich or something these are like five star bloody restaurants in there now yeah. i think that people have just become absolutely obsessed with eating i i i believe that my 1970s diet is something which there's no excuse that these people were thinner that's it were they healthier probably not i don't know you've done the research i don't know type 2 diabetes no no it was less on. definitely less diabetes okay less but they had other diabetes. things but what, if you, just, but what if you just cut out the smoking cut out the amount of drinking they were doing and had that diet, do you think that would be a healthier option for people? Which diet? 1970s diet. Yeah. Even for though sure. they were having that, you know, lovely treacle pudding and yeah, stuff. Yeah, if you want, listen, it's again, the amount that people are eating mm. is a big issue. I mean, I personally have very little sugar. I don't crave it anymore. And I was a former, I call myself a sugar addict. I had about, as we talked earlier, I had about 40 teaspoons of sugar a day. Mm. And only when I started working at the research. I didn't know that was you. I thought you said, Average person. No, no, I, I was, I was having forty. I was, I, I mean, I remember, you know, sugared syrup for breakfast, orange juice, mid morning Kit Kat. I have whatever. orange juice. I have squash. No, but I have this. I have squash. I was active. I, I was active, but but, but I then I realised that just being active and keeping slim is not mm. healthy if you're having bad food. So then I changed my diet, and and I I lost I lost not uh, on purpose, but I ended up losing about stone, and it was all around my my waist. Um, so, you know, I lost probably some body fat when I, when I cut the sugar out. Um, so I, I kind of empathize, you know, I wasn't, I'm, but I'm probably genetically not one of those people that would ever be obese, but I'm probably no, one of those people like me. Yeah, no. that would, you know, maybe be the guy with the, with the pot. Yeah. Belly, yeah. If I know. put on weight, it would go on my belly or exactly. something. Yeah. So then that's not healthy either. So, so do you agree that if we went back to a 1970s diet minus the cigarettes, uh, and then minus the heavy drinking, although... I think women are drinking more now than men in those days. Um, I don't know. I don't have the, 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 the Listen, statistics. Listen, I think if people had But if we one, went back to yeah. that, if we went back to that 1970s diet, minus the bad shit, and we had that same relationship with food, there was less food about, you know, there were two restaurants in your high street rather than 22. And if people were exercising the same way, swimming, doing competitive sports, walking the dog, if we did that, would we all be a lot slimmer yeah, and we'd healthier? Yeah, re we'd reverse the BC epidemic within a few years. So I'm right. But you said the event, you talked about the availability, so you agree that it's about the availability. Yes, I do agree a lot with the environment, but I, I'm a little bit different to you. Where I, this is where we, you know, don't agree is that I, I feel it, it is down to personal restraint, just like smoking. I don't blame my two cigarettes a day on anyone on the fact that I can purchase cigarettes from the shop. I'm not going to blame the shop. I'm not going to blame the corner shop because he's selling cigarettes. It's my choice. I'm the idiot for smoking. I take it. I take the blame. So if someone says, no, it's that shop's fault because it was selling pies or it's that advert, it's that food porn that's everywhere around, it, there, it's their fault. Why can't they take responsibility like I do for smoking? Because you have the ability to make an informed choice and then you decide to smoke and you say it's my responsibility. If I did the same thing, I would say it's mine. I think a lot of the people we talk about with these weight issues don't have that um, ability to make that informed choice like you do. Okay. <laughs> That's got nothing to do with intelligence or their background. Well, it could be, yeah, it could be that. It can be a combination mm, of things. It okay. can be intelligence, understanding, mm -hmm. um, uh, ability to, to absorb information, mm. basic knowledge, 
um, access where they live, their stress, their social circumstances, all of these things play in. Okay. Um, Asim, you've been a great sport. You've been a really good sport. Um, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. I think that the, I'm for, for sure, I know that the viewers and uh, the listeners have, have learned a lot. So uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming onto the Thank show. You, um, check out your diet. Is it in a book form, isn't it? Yeah, it's P-O-P diet. P-I-O-P-I. P-O-P diet. Great. If I could recommend it's... anything, it would be that. Or, or my <laughs> 1970s free diet free <laughs> okay thank you very right. much thank you Kezia remember guys check out the website kezia-noble.com for more information about my products and my live events um, yeah if you're watching this on YouTube remember to hit the subscribe button and I hope to see you soon take care